I want to welcome you back to the prophecy that marks the time of the end. This is me at Masada in Israel. Masada was one of the Jews' last strongholds when the Romans came in and they destroyed the city of Jerusalem. Then some of the Jews ran, about a thousand of them, up to Masada on this tall hill. Now in this video, I'm looking, uh, you're looking down on me and then we'll kind of pan out here. And so the Jews were safe and secure on this mountain because whenever the Romans would try to scale this mountain, the Jews, they would take big stones or rocks and throw them on top of the uh, Romans. And this is a huge stronghold here that the Jews went to. And so what happened at the very end of this uh, routing as they routed Jerusalem and went in and destroyed it is that the um, the Romans, they realized that the, uh, I'm sorry, the Jews realized that the Romans had breached their stronghold up on Masada. And so the Jews, about 956 of them, committed mass suicide because they didn't want those unclean dogs, the Romans, to do that kind of thing to them, to kill them. And so today we're going to look at a time prophecy that not only predicts the downfall of the Jews at Masada, and Jerusalem, but extends to the time of the end, the very day and month and year of the time of the end. The title of my presentation is The Prophecy That Marks the Time of the End, and let's have a word of prayer as we get together now. Father in heaven, we're thankful for your great love for us, and as we look at this most important prophecy, the 2300 years, we pray that your Holy Spirit will touch us and move in our hearts in a very special way. As we open the word of God, we pray that the same spirit that inspired the writing of it will inspire the reading of it right now, and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Sir Isaac Newton was converted because of this prophecy we're going to be looking at today, and it's quite an amazing prophecy. In Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14, he said unto me, For two thousand and three hundred days then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now, before we try to understand this prophecy, the most important and fundamental thing we need to do is understand what a day is symbolic of in the Bible. Does anybody know what a day equals in Bible prophecy? Well, that's right. Uh, some of you got that right. Equals a year. And um, so we have a prophetic key here from Ezekiel 4 and verse 6, Numbers 14, verse 33. Only in Bible prophecy does God use this, not in creation or anything like that. So 2,300 days would actually be 2,300 years in this prophecy. Now let's try to figure this prophecy out, what it's talking about and when it begins and when it ends. Let's skip down to verse 17, Daniel 8 and verse 17. So he came near to where I was standing, and when he came, I was afraid, and I fell upon my face. But he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision. All right, so folks, the very first clue we have here is this 2300-year prophecy takes us to the very time of of the end. If you ever wondered if there's a time prophecy that tells us when the time of the end would be here, this is it. Not the day or the hour of Christ's coming, but rather the time of the end. And so this is the Bible's longest prophecy. Verse 27 tells us what happened to Daniel when he tried to figure this prophecy out. Daniel 8 and verse 27, and I, Daniel, fainted, and I was sick certain days. Afterward, I rose up and did the king's business, and I was astonished at the vision, but none understood it. So folks, the good news is, if you don't understand this prophecy, you're in good company because even Daniel, the beloved man of God, he could not understand it. But hopefully by the end of this presentation today, you'll be able to understand this. So I'm going to briefly tell you about the cleansing of the sanctuary to help you understand what this verse means. And then we'll do a more in-depth study at the end of this uh, presentation. So this is me representing the high priest and the Old Testament in a sanctuary model I used in Indiana, USA. This is a scaled model here. And so in the Old Testament, the high priest went into the most holy place, and then there was Aaron's rod that budded, and if you, uh, there was the um, manna, 
and uh, then the tables of stone that had the Ten Commandments. And um, so what the high priest did is he went once a year into the most holy place to cleanse the sanctuary because the sin and guilt had been symbolically transferred into the most holy place. However, we're living in the New Testament now, and since there's no Old Testament sanctuary, we have to ask ourselves, what does this symbolism mean to the New Testament Christian? And since there's no earthly sanctuary and the earthly sacrificial system has been done away with at the cross, and Hebrews 8 and 9 says that the heavenly sanctuary is in heaven right now, and that's where we should be focusing. Uh, So Jesus is at the right hand of the Father cleansing that heavenly sanctuary of our sins in the most holy place. And once he's finished at the end of the 2300 years, then the time of the end has come. We're going to come back to this in a few minutes. But for now, what we have to do is realize after Daniel gets the prophecy, he faints. And guess what the angel does? Well, the angel just goes back to heaven. And in the next chapter, after Daniel recovers from his fainting spell, the angel comes back to explain the 2300-year prophecy. All right, so let's go to Daniel 9 now. So the prophecy was in Daniel 8. The explanation of this prophecy is in Daniel 9. Let's start with verse 21. Here's Daniel speaking. Yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of your supplication, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision, end of quote, of the 2300 year prophecy. This is what the angel is coming to explain to Daniel. And then verse 24, Daniel 9 and verse 24, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Now, folks, there's about a half a dozen things that the angel said have to happen at the end of this 70 weeks. So let's back up a little bit here. So it says 70 weeks are determined upon your people, Daniel. So the big question is, who are Daniel's people? Well, they are the Jews, right? And then this prophecy has to do with Daniel's city. Well, what city is that? Well, that's Jerusalem, right? So if you ever wondered about the Jews and Jerusalem, this is the most specific prophecy in all the Bible. There's a lot of speculation about the Jews and Jerusalem in the Christian world right now, and it is wild. However, what's happening, the rest of the Christian world, they're not looking at this clearest prophecy right here in the Bible. So as you know, there are seven days in each week. So 70 weeks would be 70 times seven, which is 490 years. So as we use this principle of a day for a year, we're looking at 490 years. So the Jews in Jerusalem had been given 490 years probationary time to get their acts together. What were they supposed to do? Finish transgression, put an end to sin, and to clear up iniquity. So what we need to know now is when do these 2300 years begin? Once we find out the beginning date of the 2300 years, then that'll automatically show us the ending date there. And the event that helps give us the date is found in Daniel 9 and verse 25. Daniel 9, 25, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks, that's 69 weeks, the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. So the 490 years brings us to the end of the Jews as a chosen people of God and to the Messiah, the prince. And by the way, Messiah means the anointed one. All right, so who is the anointed prince of God? Well, that's obviously Jesus. And according to verse 25, it begins at the command to restore Jerusalem. 
All right, so if we can find that decree and that date, then we have a starting date for our prophecy. So let's go to Ezra chapter 7. In Ezra chapter 7, we're going to see that very command to restore and build Jerusalem. Ezra chapter 7, let's start with verse 11. Now this is the copy of the letter that King Artaxerxes gave to Ezra, the priest, the scribe, even the scribe of the words of the commandments of the Lord and of his statutes to Israel. All right, so this is specifically for Israel, what this prophecy is talking about. Verse 12, Artaxerxes, king of kings, to Ezra the priest, a scribe of the law of God of heaven, perfect peace, and at such a time, I make a decree that all of they of thy people of Israel and of his priests and Levites in my realm, which are minded of their own free will, to go up Jerusalem to go with you. So he not only gives a decree giving the Jews freedom to go to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple, but in verse 20, he provides money out of the king's treasury to do this. Look at verse 20. Ezra 7 and verse 20. And whatsoever more shall be needful for thy house of thy God, which thou shalt have occasion to bestow, bestow it out of the king's treasure house. And I, even I, Artaxerxes the king, do make a decree to all the treasures which are beyond the river, that whatsoever Ezra the priest ascribed the law of God the heaven shall require of you, it be done speedily. All right, so this is the decree. Now, if your Bible has dates in the margin, and a lot of paper Bibles do have dates in the marginal reference here, it's going to tell you the date of that decree. However, if you have an electronic Bible, like on your iPhone, then most of those do not have that decree. All right, so if you have a marginal reference in your Bible, what is that date? Well, the date is 457. That's exactly when Ezra or Artaxerxes made this decree to rebuild Jerusalem. And therefore, that's the beginning date of the 2300 year prophecy, as well as all the other time prophecies that we're going to look at in Daniel chapter 8, but especially in Daniel chapter 9. All right, so if we do a little Bible math, this is the decree 457 BC. Remember, the angel said 490 years were given to the Jews and Jerusalem. All right, so if you add 490 to 457 BC, and you have to add one because there's no zero year, then you come to the year 34 AD. So what happened in 34 AD that ended the Jews' probationary time? Well, let's go to Acts chapter 7 and see exactly what happened and uh, the events that mark the end of the Jewish nation as God's chosen people. Acts chapter 7, let's start with verse 59. And they, that is the Jews, stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And Stephen kneeled down, cried with a loud voice, saying, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Now, as you know, in the Bible, it means he died when they fell asleep oftentimes. All right, so again, if your Bible has dates in it, when does Stephen get stoned to death? Well, that is 34 A.D. All right, so if you add the 490-year prophecy to the 457 B.C., what do, date do you get? So here's the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Add 490 years, come to 340, 30, uh, I'm sorry, A.D. 34, and that's when they stone Stephen. So the Jews not only reject Jesus as Messiah and kill him on the cross, they reject his followers and begin to kill them. And Stephen is the first Christian martyr, and it happens on the year 34 A.D., just as this prophecy said it would happen. And Daniel 9 said that they had 490 years to get their act together, but they didn't. So what happened? Well, let's look at the next verse. Acts chapter 8 and verse 1, And Saul, in the name of Judaism, was consenting unto his death. And at the time there was a great persecution against the church, which was where? At Jerusalem. Now remember, folks, this prophecy has to do with Daniel's people and Daniel's holy city. That's the Jews and Jerusalem. And so here's a fulfillment of that prophecy. 
And, uh, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Acts chapter 8 and verse 2. Let's go to verse 2 and onward. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. What is Philip doing going to Samaria? Philip was a Jew. And now he's going to Samaria, a place that the Jews detested because they believe the Samaritans were unclean dogs. So why is this Jew Philip going down there? Well, because this time prophecies come to an end at 34 AD. Because the Jews did not put an end to sin or to transgression, and now the gospel is taken from the Jews and given to the Gentiles. And so it's partly because this time prophecies come to an end. And uh, so we see Saul's wreaking havoc on the Christians, but he's converted over the next few verses. The gospel goes to the Gentiles. It's removed from the Jews. This all started when? It all started in 34 AD when the time prophecy said it would. Folks, you can stake your life on the word of God. Then look, look what happens in Acts chapter 13 and verse 45, starting with verse 45. Acts chapter 13, let's start with verse 45. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. But seeing that you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Now, folks, why was it necessary for the word of God to be preached to the Jews? Because they were God's chosen people. But then we come to the end of this time prophecy in 34 AD, and Paul and Barnabas, they wax bold, and they say, okay, Jews, you've rejected it. Lo, we turn to the Gentiles. And so this great time prophecy struck, and, uh, and it was now given to the Gentiles. So Saul the persecutor is converted. He becomes Paul the apostle. Now look at verse 48, Acts chapter 13 and verse 48. We'll start there. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. All right, so now what's happening here? The Gentiles are being converted, and now they're making up God's church. Look at verse 49. And the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region, but the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coast. So right there at 34 AD, the Jews reject God. For the final time, God opens up the gospel to the Gentiles. I love how perfect God is and God's time prophecies are. Folks, you can stake your life on the word of God and prophecy. What do you say? So in this discussion, we have to ask ourselves, who is spiritual Israel? Now, Jesus prophesied of Israel in Matthew 21 and verse 43 and this is when Jesus is alive. He's on the earth. He's preaching to the apostles, preaching to the Jews who are flocking out to see him. And this is what he says to the Jewish nation. Therefore, I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you. In other words, taken away from the Jewish nation and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. Who was that? That was the Gentiles. And how did Jesus know that? Well, he's the son of God, of course, but it's also because Jesus read this prophecy in, John ch in Daniel chapter nine. And so in, John, in Daniel chapter nine, he knew that this time prophecy was coming to an end. And then look at Galatians three and verse 28 and nine. 
The Apostle Paul says there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you're all one in Christ, and if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now, folks, this would be a blasphemous statement for Paul to make to the Jews of his day. There's neither Jew or Greek. The Jews thought they were better than the Greeks and the Gentiles and the Philistines and everybody around them. However, Paul said, no, this is no longer the case. What has God done? God has said, no, there's no more distinction between them. And so how do you become a spiritual Jew? Well, if you are Christ, if you belong to Jesus, if he's your savior, then who are you? You are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Folks, you are a spiritual Jew if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your savior. And so the end of this 490 year prophecy had come and the Jews were still unrepentant. So God said, enough is enough. Your probationary time is over. I now go to the Gentiles. And um, so all the promises and commands given to the Jews apply to you and me. So this is me at the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem. So why is there a Wailing Wall at Jerusalem? Well, because their temple's been destroyed, like Jesus said it would in Matthew 24 and verse 2 and Matthew 23 verses 37 and 8. And Jesus said unto them, he's talking to the disciples and also to the Jews, and he says, you see not all these things, verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now Jesus is looking at the temple, the Jewish temple there in Jerusalem. And he makes this astonishing prophecy that not one stone's gonna be left on another. And then in Matthew 23 and verse 37 and eight, he says, oh, Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, you that kill the prophets and stone them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen gathers her chicks. And then he goes on and says, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. And so once again, the salvation message is now taken away from the Jews. They're no longer God's chosen people. And then Luke 19 and verse 43, for the day shall come upon thee that your enemy shall cast a trench about you and compass ye the round about and keep you in on every side. But Jesus turning to them said, daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming in the which they shall say, blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bear and the paps which never gave suck. Now folks, Jesus saw into the future. And even though this didn't happen for about another 40 years later, Jesus knew the end of Jerusalem and the end of the temple was there. And that's why there's a wailing wall. This is me in the striped shirt over on the right there. And um, because Jesus knew this prophecy in Daniel chapter nine was coming to pass. And why did he say, weep not for me, but for yourselves and your children? Well, folks, a terrible thing happened at the destruction of Jerusalem. This very prophecy came to pass. The, the enemies of the, Jerus of the Jews, that is the Romans, they literally put a trench around Jerusalem. They surrounded them. They locked them in and they were not allowed to go in or out to get food or water starvation became a horrible thing and the jews inside jerusalem they were being starved out by the romans they were so hungry they would gnaw on their leather belts hoping to god that they could get a little nourishment out of their leather belts or their leather sandals and then the terrible thing happened here jesus said blessed are the barren and the wombs that never gave bear and the paps which never gave suck. Folks, the starvation was so horrific in Jerusalem at that time. As 
the Jewish people were starving to death. And I don't know if you've ever done any fasting. I've done quite a bit of fasting in my life. And there comes a point where you fast so many days and it feels like your belly button is meeting your spine and you're starving to death. That's what they came to. And folks, I hate to report this, but women literally killed and cooked and ate their own children in fulfillment of these prophecies here. And now instead of the Jews' temple, there's an Islamic mosque on the mount that angers the Jews to no end because the Jews believe they are still God's chosen people and they hate the thought that the Muslims have a building, a mosque on the Jewish mount there. This is me in front of the mosque. This is my wife, dressed the part so she doesn't offend. And we went to this mosque in 2011. It's quite impressive. So God warned the Jews way back in Leviticus 26 and verse 27 through 31, if you won't listen to me, uh, you will eat the flesh of your sons and the flesh of your daughters. I will make your cities a waste and bring your sanctuaries to desolation. And folks, for the last Thousands and thousands of years, the Jewish nation have been cut off from God. All right, so now back to Daniel chapter 9. And so in um, 69 weeks times 7 days a week, that's 483 years. Well, let's read about this. And um, so in 457, we had the decree to restore Jerusalem. In 34 AD, the Jewish nation was cut off and the message was given to the Gentiles. Now, let's look at this time prophecy, the 483-year time prophecy. So part of the reason that Daniel fainted and couldn't understand this vision in chapter 8 is it was too long, 2,300 years long, so the angel breaks it down. Daniel 9 and verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah, the Prince shall be seven weeks, three score, and two weeks. At 69 weeks, a street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublous times. All right, so take that 69 weeks we just read about, multiply that by seven days in a week, you get 483 years, and you add that to 457. Remember, that is our starting date, way back in Ezra. That brings us to the year 27. Well, what would happen in the year 27 AD? Well, it says the Messiah would be anointed. So who's Messiah? Well, of course, that's Jesus. How and when was he anointed? Well, you know the answer to that. Jesus was baptized right on 27 AD, and the Holy Spirit came down on him in the form of a dove and anointed him and prepared him for ministry. So perfectly fulfilling this prophecy. All right, now let's read verse 26. Back to Daniel 9 and verse 26. After three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince, that is the Romans, that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end war desolations are determined, and he... Verse 27, that is Messiah, shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the middle of the week, he shall cause a sacrifice and the oblations to cease. All right, so here's the week. From 27 to 34, you've got seven years. Here's when he was anointed or baptized and the Holy Spirit came upon him. Here's when the Jews' probationary time was cut off. So in the middle of that week, after three and a half years at 31 AD, he would cause the sacrifice and the oblations to cease. How did he do that? Well, because Jesus is the true Lamb of God, after he died on the cross of Calvary, there was no need any longer to have sacrifices and oblations. And so this happened perfectly on time, as the prophecy said it was. He's anointed in 27, crucified in 31, and the gospel went to the Gentiles in 34. 
Now, let's add 1,810 years to this prophecy, because remember, this is looking at the details of the 70-week prophecy, but it originated with the 2,300-year prophecy. So now that we've gone up to here, let's add the 1,810 years that are left and to 34 AD, and that brings us to the year 1844. Interesting. What happened in 1844? I was flying across America a few years ago, and I sat next to a Christian, and he had his computer out, and he had uh, a Bible study going. So I, I talked to him, and we tried to witness to each other. And we got onto the topic of Daniel chapter 9. And he had it almost perfect on the first part of this prophecy. And I was amazed that we agreed because we're not of the same denomination. And then I said to him at the end of this study, so what about the rest of the prophecy that takes us to 1844? What happened then? And he got a quizzical look on his face. He said, I don't know. <laughs> All right, so what about it, folks? Some Christians understand the first part of this prophecy, but the, not the last part. So let's try to understand that. According to this prophecy, the cleansing of the sanctuary and the time of the end began in 1844. And you say, well, what does that mean? Well, let's go to Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. Remember, in the Old Testament sanctuary, they cleanse the earthly sanctuary once a year on the Day of Atonement, also known as the Day of Judgment. But since the New Testament sanctuary is in heaven right now, and the earthly one has been destroyed, then we have to go to the heavenly sanctuary to see what's happening right now in connection to the cleansing of the sanctuary. All right, let's go to Hebrews 8, and we're going to get a better understanding of what that means and what began in 1844. Hebrews 8 and verse 1, we'll start with that verse. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum, we have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of majesty in the heavens. Now I want you to notice, the earthly high priest was set in the earthly sanctuary. The New Testament high priest, which is Jesus, is where? According to verse 1, he's in the heavenly sanctuary. Verse 2, a minister of the sanctuary and, not of the, and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. So according to this, Jesus is in the heavenly sanctuary right now since the earthly one's been destroyed. All right, so there was two sanctuaries in the Bible, the earthly one and the uh, heavenly one that verse 2 talks about. Now, Nerd and I, we were literal shepherds uh, near Auckland, and I had a young couple in my church that helped me make this video, and uh, so they're helping me feed these lambs here. So if you lived in the Old Testament times, uh, you would take a lamb. Now, these are triplets we had. We had to uh, bottle feed them because uh, shepherds, uh, you know, and that if you have triplets and oftentimes the runt of the, the flock, the runts, they don't get enough food, so you have to supplement feed them. So that's what we're doing here. So we had some beautiful speckled uh, lambs here. And so they're cute, they're innocent, and they run around and they jump in the air and they squiggle their body, these lambs do. And I so enjoyed being a shepherd. But if you lived in the Old Testament, what you would have to do every time you sinned and every day of the week, you would take one of these beautiful, innocent, cute lambs and you would take it to the sanctuary, earthly sanctuary. And you'd lay your hands on it and confess your sins over it. And then you would take the knife and slit its throat and watch the blood pour out of that innocent, beautiful funny lamb. Every day you had to do that. And of course, all of this represented Jesus according to John 1 and verse 29. And so instead of the earthly sanctuary, we're now in the heavenly sanctuary. And instead of presenting the earthly lamb for our sins, we're presenting the heavenly lamb, Jesus Christ. Now, let's see what Paul has to say about this in Hebrews chapter 9. 
And you can watch a video of me in this scaled model of the sanctuary while uh, we're reading, if you would like. Hebrews chapter 9, let's start with verse 1. Then verily, the first covenant, or the old covenant, or Old Testament, had also ordinances of divine service, a worldly sanctuary, or a sanctuary on earth, Verse, f- verse 2, for there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was a candlestick, the table of showbread, which is called the sanctuary. After the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer, the ark of the covenant laid round about with gold, wherein was a golden pot that had manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. Hebrews 9 and verse 5, over it were the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now I'll speak particularly. Now, when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. Now, pay attention because verse 7 is the cleansing of the sanctuary from Daniel 8 that we started this 2300 year prophecy on. Verse 7, Hebrews 9. But into the second veil went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. All right, so this is a reference to the cleansing of the sanctuary or the day of judgment or the day of atonement. Now, on the Day of Atonement, he sprinkled the blood over the Ark of the Covenant that contained the Ten Commandment law that they had broken. And if there was sin in the camp, then the high priest would be slain instantly. So um, if, if you heard this video, you would hear the bells and pomegranates on my skirt tinkling. So every time the high priest was doing his ministration, then the pomegranates would tinkle the bells so they knew that he was alive. However, if there was sin in the camp, then they wouldn't hear those bells anymore. And Jewish tradition tells us that they tied a rope to his ankle. So if he was slain by the glory of God, they couldn't go retrieve him because they would be slain as well. So they could pull him out with this rope. So this cleansing of the sanctuary that's symbolized in the Old Testament is symbolic of what's happening right now not on the earthly sanctuary, but in the heavenly sanctuary. And when did it begin? It began in 1844. As a matter of fact, look at Revelation 14. We're going to start with verse 6. Revelation 14 and verse 6. I saw another angel fly in the middle of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth and to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And so the day of atonement was called the judgment hour. And so God is telling us the judgment hour has come and we've been living in the day of atonement since 1844 in preparation for the final phase of the judgment. In other words, we are living on the brink of eternity, folks. The end of the world is just upon us. How many years did Noah's day get from the time Noah announced judgment, from the day that Noah announced the end of the world until the final phase of judgment, that is the punishment of the wicked, happened? They got 120 years. Folks, we have been given more probationary time. So since 1844, the same announcement that Noah had, we have had. That is the hour of his judgment has come. And as it took 120 years for the final phase of that judgment to happen in Noah's day, so since 1844, we are waiting for the final phase of God's judgment. Do you know what they had to do in the Old Testament on the Day of Atonement and about seven days before it when they did the Feast of Trumpets? They would come out every day and they would blow a trumpet. And that was to remind the people that the Day of Atonement was coming in a few days time. 
What did they have to do at that point? They had to pray and fast and afflict their souls and search their heart and make sure that they were right with God. And so, folks, since 1844, Jesus has been in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, and he is doing the last phase of the judgment. And so while Jesus is in the most holy place in heaven right now, on the earth, God's people should be doing the same thing as they did in the Old Testament, praying, fasting, and searching their hearts and preparing for the second coming of Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but when I realize what this prophecy means, to me, it makes me tremble. However, we can have the assurance of salvation in Jesus Christ, can't we? I'm gonna tell you the story of Martin Luther. Now, this is the reformer of the Dark Ages, not the modern day Martin Luther. Anyway, uh, some of you know Martin Luther was a priest of the Catholic Church, a very godly man. And as a Catholic priest, he was trying to please God and trying to follow God. And, um, and then he began to see some problems within the Catholic Church, and he began to call for some reformations. And he, began, he became known as the first protestant. He was protesting some of the abuses coming out of the Catholic Church. And so um, he, he left the church, and one day, as he's praying to God, and he's fasting, and he's just trying to get close to God, he had a dream that night, and in his dream, the devil came to Martin Luther, and the devil had a long list of sins. And he said to Martin Luther, and he started reading out the sins, and they were detailed sins of Martin Luther himself, and he recognized them. And so Satan said to Martin Luther, did you commit this sin? And all he could do is hang his head in shame and say, yes. And then the devil read the next sin in detail. And the devil said to Martin Luther, did you commit this sin? Again, in shame and anguish. Martin Luther just hung his head and said, yes. And then the devil dropped the roll, and the roll rolled across the floor for three meters. That's how many sins, and in detail, that Satan had on Martin Luther. And so Martin Luther was hugely discouraged and ready to give up. And then Martin Luther looked up and he saw that the devil had his hand over something that was written on those sins. And so Martin Luther said, Devil, remove your hand. And the devil said, ignore that. You're a sinner. You're going to hell. You're lost. And Martin Luther said, in the name of Jesus Christ, remove your hand. Well, folks, in the name of Jesus, the devils tremble and they have to obey. And so the devil removed his hand. And what was behind his hand there? Well, 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7 says the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And so Martin Luther realized this long list of sins in great detail had been blotted out by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so you can be sure when the final phase of the judgment expires, when the sealing happens, and you are sealed either, and you can be sealed righteous, and you don't have to be sealed unrighteous. You can trust the blood of Jesus Christ. You can be secure in Jesus, but you must be decisive about obeying him. And so if it's your desire to follow Jesus Christ all the way, won't you just in the privacy of your own home or for those who are in the audience today, won't you make a commitment right now and say, Jesus, I want to serve you and I want to invite you into my heart and to take me in to the very last days of earth's history so we can go to heaven together and live the rest of eternity. If that is your desire, won't you pray with me? 
Father in heaven, we're thankful for Jesus. And as we look at this powerful 2300 year prophecy, how it brings us to the time of the end, help us not to fear, but help us to trust in Jesus and trust his blood, just like Martin Luther had to. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.